Romans chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. Therefore thou art inexcusable, O man, whosoever thou art that judgest. For when, wherein thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself, for thou judgest, excuse me, for thou that judgest dost the same things. But we are sure that the judgment of God is according to truth against them which commit such things. And think thou this, O man, that judgest them which do the same such things, and doest the same, that thou shalt escape the judgment of God? Or despisest thou the riches of his goodness, and forbearance, and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance? But after the high hardness, after thy hardness and impenitent heart, Treasures up unto thyself wrath against that day of wrath and revelation of the righteousness, the righteous judgment of God. And just speak now, Lord. One of the fo- funniest, the most ironic things that I run into in, in my work and ministry with the Lord and opportunities to counsel is how often someone will come into me to speak about how they have been so offended by someone's actions. Oftentimes, even in the church, it's not necessarily just the world. They get offended by what somebody else has done in the church to them. And we'll begin to discuss this matter, and I'll often ask the question or two about the offense in particular, and what they found so offensive about the situation, only to discover that they, in retaliation for what they were offended by, went out and committed the same offenses against the person of whom they were offended by. But somehow they think that they're righteous in their judgment. Now we're going to spend the bulk of our morning this morning trying to understand an often misunderstood and definitely misquoted idea about judgment. I am sure there isn't any amongst us who has never been told or heard something to the effect of, don't judge me. Now, we might hear it from somebody in a playful tone, don't judge me. Or we might hear it in more of a scornful tone, don't judge me. But really, in all honesty, the heart leads to the same condition, no matter the tone. The idea that you don't have the right to judge me. So the question for us this morning that I want to answer is, do we? Is do we have the right to judge? This comes from a misquote. Um, Actually, let's just turn there first. Matthew chapter 7. It's amazing how people will misquote things when they want to defend their own selfish or or sinful acts. This comes from Matthew chapter 7. Let's just read verses 1 through 5 of this passage here. Matthew chapter 7, verses 1 through 5. The Lord Jesus speaking says, Judge not that ye be not judged. For with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. And with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. And why beholdest thou the mote in thy brother's eye, but considerest not the beam that is in thine own? Or how wilt thou say to thy brother, Let me pull out the mote of thine eye, and behold, a beam is in thine own? Thou hypocrite, First cast out the beam out of thine own eye, and then shalt thou see clearly to cast out the mote of thy brother's eye. Now, it's kind of a funny word picture if you think about this for a second. The idea that that somebody may have a speck in their eye, and here you are walking around with a beam. Not a log, as sometimes we think about, but a beam. When you think about a beam, I mean, there's a beam supporting this ceiling. There's something huge in your own life that you're not dealing with. It's a funny word picture to think about me trying to do surgery or on somebody's eyes. I can't even get close enough to him because of the beam in my own. So he tells us that we must be, deal with our own beam first. Now, I want you to understand something. When he says remove that, it doesn't necessarily mean the beam doesn't exist anymore. He never says get rid of the beam. He just says remove it. The idea is this. Before you go to somebody else to deal with their issues or their problems or the specks in their eyes, we must be willing to humble ourselves before God 
and repentance for the areas in which we fell. So that we go to them in a heart of humility. In a heart of humility. Because I guarantee you, and maybe you've had this happen to you, I guarantee you there's not one of us who will not be put off by arrogance. If I come to you and I say to you, I've noticed that you're, you seem to be struggling in this area, you're stumbling around in this area, you're having a difficult time in this area. In a heart of humility and love, you're more likely to listen to me than if when you walk in, I go, I can't believe what you did. Do you know what the Bible says about that? I mean, you're automatically going to have your, your, your hackles go up, right? I picture a cat with their back up in the air, and they're, I'm ready to fight, right? And this is kind of that idea. Now, he's not saying we don't go. Notice he never said, don't go to them. He said, don't go to them until you're prepared. Until you're prepared. Verse 1 of this passage out of Matthew chapter 7 is the one that people will most likely quote when it comes to them with the concerns that you may have or express for their life or their choices, which leads us again to that question, can we judge? He says, judge not that ye be not judged. So can we judge? Well, herein is the issue. Believe it or not, they're not wrong in quoting that. Their intentions are wrong. Their defenses are wrong. But in quoting judge not or don't judge me, they're not necessarily wrong. The word here in this passage for judge is the krino in the Greek, and it really carries with it the idea of condemning someone or to decide for them their fate, if you would. Now, none of us gets to do that. None of you can decide my fate, and I can't decide any of your fates. That is the Lord Jesus Christ's work and God Almighty's work only. Maybe it helps us to understand when we start to think about dealing with someone else's sin, if we bear in mind the idea that what we don't want to leave them with is an, is, is an ideal or an idea or a feeling of condemnation of condemnation because that is not ours to do we don't get to condemn I don't get to send anybody to hell praise be to God but likewise I don't get to send anyone to heaven oftentimes we are more than willing to think that somebody should go to hell for their actions And there are only a few selected in our life that we, we value worthy of heaven. But that is not how the Lord looks at us. He never looked at us that way. We were all yet dead in our trespasses and sins when he came and died for us. He, did, he came to send every one of us to heaven that would accept that he desires that none should perish, but that all should come to the knowledge of him. He wants us all in heaven. Let's look at the parallel passage for this Matthew chapter, though, in Luke chapter 6. Turn with me to Luke chapter 6. Luke chapter 6. I want to look at right now just verses 37 through 42. Luke chapter 6. Again, our Lord speaking says, Judge not, and ye shall not be judged. Condemn not, and ye shall not be condemned. Forgive, and ye shall be forgiven. Give, and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down and shaken together and running over, shall men give into your bosom. For with the same measure that ye meet with all, it shall be measured to you again. And he spake a parable unto them. Can the blind lead the blind? Shall they not both fall into the ditch? The disciple is not above his master, but every one that is perfect shall be as his master." And why beholdest thou the mote in thy brother's eye, and perceive not the beam that is in thine own? Either thou canst say to thy brother, Brother, let me pull out the mote that is in thine eye, when thou, ha but when thou thyself beholdest not the beam that is in thine own eye. You hypocrite, cast out the beam of your own eye, and then shalt thou see clearly 
to pull out the mote that is my brother's eye. I want you to notice there that he says that when we deal with our own issues first, we begin to see clearly, don't we? We begin to see clearly. The idea of seeing clearly is very important. It's no different than an, I don't care what your vision is. You don't come to me, I'm 2020 or I'm whatever. I don't even know what all the numbers could possibly be. I'm not, I'm not an optometrist. But you've all driven or ridden in a car with a dirty windshield. And doesn't it just drive you nuts to sit there and know that that person has the capability of turning on that little windshield wiper fluid washer thing and yet they refuse to do it? Right? One of the things that drives Chandra nuts is oftentimes we'll be driving in the rain, and I don't think rain is really worth wiping off your windshield until it gets to a certain point. But she thinks the minute there's a drop on the windshield, it should be gone. That she can see clearly. I'm like, well, the important one that has to see clearly is me. I'm the one driving. She doesn't agree with that idea. Probably wisely so. But nonetheless, you want it cleaned. You want to be able to see clearly so you can see the direction you should be going. Paying attention to the road. And it's scary as the windshield begins to build up with more and more water. And I won't lie, it's kind of a game for me. It's probably wrong. Actually, I know it's wrong. <laughs> but it's kind of a game for me because I'm like going, how long can I, will Chandra hold out? How long will Chandra hold out? And it kind of becomes a game for me until she finally goes, will you clean the windshield? <laughs> Now, he says, before we go to somebody, though, we should clean our windshield. We should make sure we're wiped clean that we can see clearly what we're about to deal with. You have no idea what is going on in that person's life. You have no idea what struggles and temptations and things that they may be dealing with in their life. All you see is the external circumstance of what you're watching. And you fail to recognize that if it weren't for the grace of God and your own repentance and humility, that you may be dealing with the same thing. We need to go with clear vision to our brother or our sister in Christ when we're trying to help correct them or reprove them or to help them. We need to see clearly. That doesn't mean we have to know every given detail of what's happening in their life or in their heart. I can't know that. But it does mean that I need to see clearly and not be distracted by my own judgments or perceptions, being humbled and understanding. But for the grace of God, I would be the same. We need to see clearly. Now, we're still in Luke. Hopefully you're still in Luke. And we read verses 37 through 42, but I want you to look before verse 37. Pick it up with me at verses 35 and 36 real quick. Look what he says right before he gets into this judging others. But love your enemies and do good and lend hope, hope for nothing, excuse me, and lend hoping for nothing again, and your reward shall be great. And ye shall be children of the highest, for he is kind unto the unthankful and to the evil. Be therefore merciful as your Father also is merciful. Isn't that one of the most difficult things to do is to be kind when somebody is treating you with such disdain or anger or vig vigor? It's just like, you're just, what? No, Lord, let's smack him around a little bit. And if you don't want to do it, Lord, I'll volunteer. But he says, no, that we need to be willing to be rewarded of him. So even if what you're judging somebody in is an offense against you, he says that you need to let God deal with that. And then he says, be ye therefore merciful as your Father is merciful. Are you holding people to a higher standard than you hold yourself to? We probably all do to a certain extent, don't we? I mean, let's be honest. I expect more of my son at his age than I expected, or I probably would have wanted my parents to expect of me at mine. Likewise, we do the same in our own lives. We expect more. The problem is, is some of our children run out of the gates, and they just, they, they seem like, like my son, I'm going to use my son an example, he doesn't mind because he tells me that all, every day we get in the car, he's like, oh, thanks for using me again, Dad. Um, but, but my son, he kind of matured quickly as a child. 
I think part of that was because he had no siblings. Nobody to act goofy and young with. So he kind of matured quickly as a child. So I started to treat him more maturely than I should have. And expected him to be able to reason as an adult, as a child. Well, that's a foolish notion. I should have been merciful to him, understanding that he is bound up in the heart of a child still. What does it say in the Bible Bible that bound up in the heart of a child? Foolishness. Now, let's apply this to adults in our lives. What? Yes. Because do you realize that until you know the Lord Jesus Christ, you're not maturing spiritually? Do you realize that the, the shorter amount of time you've walked with the Lord, the less mature you most likely are? And your foolishness is bound up in your heart too because you perceive things the way you want them to be rather than the way they should be. But then what ne- never fails, I remember guys one time, um, shortly after I was saved, my, my, Mike and I, we started going to all sorts of different um, churches and finding Bible studies everywhere we could possibly go. And we went to this one church here in town and uh, I, I, long story short, I was bald, all right? Um, not that my hair miraculously grew back, okay? No hope, Greg. Don't worry about it. Dude, it's been a while, right? Anyway, but no, I'm just teasing, okay? But I, what happened was I went to my, my, my cousin for a haircut. Um, not a good idea, all right? By the time he, I kept asking him for a fade. Do you guys remember what a fade was, right? Remember how fades were really cool? You're supposed to look all cool and slick and it goes up, right? Okay, I asked him for a fade. Well, my fade started moving up. Further and further. So eventually, literally, I got to a mohawk. And I was like, you know what, just take it all off. So he took it all off, and I was bald. And I wore a ball cap. Because I can't stand the chia pet look. You guys know what I mean by the chia pet look? Right? When that little bit of peach fuzz starts to come back on your scalp and your hair, and it starts to grow a little bit. I can't stand that. You can't do anything with it. Right? I mean, even if you shave the sides, it just looks like even weirder. And so I, I, so I started wearing a hat everywhere I went, including in churches. Now, I was a young believer, and I went to this church. We were going there for a Bible study. We went to this church, and one of the deacons in the church comes up to me and says, you need to take your hat off. That's all he says to me. By the way, if he would have shown me the scripture, I probably would have done it. But he didn't. He says, you need to take your hat off and show some respect. So, of course, foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child. So what did I do? I put my hat on backwards. Right? Well, maybe it's the bill that's offending them. No, actually, I did that because I wanted to look like a punk. I know that. Right? But if you would actually come to me with the scripture and said, here's the problem, here's what you need to think about, and given it to me in a merciful and kind way, I probably would have examined it and possibly even taken my hat off and let people see my chia head. <laughs> but you know what? This is the idea, guys. What he's saying here is we need to come with mercy towards those people, a heart of mercy. And then I also want to look while we're in Luke, before I turn you, jump you around all over the place, I want to look at the latter part of these verses out of Luke. Look at verses 46, or 43 through 46 with me if you would. For every, excuse me, for a good tree bringeth not forth corrupt fruit, neither doth the corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. For every tree is known by his own fruit. For of the thorns of men do men gather figs. Nor of the bramble bush gather they grapes. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is good. And an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is evil. For the abundance of the heart, from, for of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaketh. And why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? Now, I want you to understand something here. Who is he saying should bring forth the good fruit? The brother who goes with the moat and the, or the brother with the beam? It's the brother with the beam that's supposed to bring forth the good fruit. If when you're rebuking people and you're correcting them, you're bringing forth nothing but bitterness and anger, maybe you haven't corrected yourself yet. Maybe you are not seen clearly yet. And you should go back and examine that first. This is the fruit he's talking about here. It's the one who's doing the correcting 
that should bring forth good fruit. Not the one who's being corrected. We hope good fruit will come from their life. And we hope good fruit will come from the situation. And they'll be fruitful because of it. But the good fruit is produced by the one who is going to their brother. In a right heart. In the right heart. So, what is the fruit of a man who is choosing to judge produce? Who is choosing to judge? What does the fruit produce? It should produce this. Turn to me to Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5. Look at verses just, just verse 22 and 23 with me. But the fruit of the Spirit. So if when you're going to correct your brother or your sister in Christ, if you have the fruit of the Spirit, this is what it should produce. The fruit of the Spirit is love. And by the way, this doesn't mean it has to produce it in the person you're correcting. This is in you. Let me make that clear. You're the one getting fruit produced in you. Right? So you don't have to worry about whether or not you go and correct somebody in a humble, humble heart seeing clearly, you don't have to worry about the fruit. You're doing the watering at that point. God will take care of the fruit. The fruit you want from that is what is in you. And this is the fruit that it should produce. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, Against such there is no law. The fruit we should want in our lives is right there, guys. If somebody was to describe you or give you an epitaph at the end of your life, would they say this is the fruit of your life? Would they be willing to describe you as somebody who loved? Somebody who was joyful? Somebody who was at peace? Were you long-suffering or patient? Were you gentle? Was the general characteristic of your life goodness? Were you faithful? Were you meek or humble? Were you temperate, self-controlled? Would that be the description they would have of you? Would that be the description if after you go and you reprove or if I would, and allow me this, this liberty here, judge somebody else. Would they say that you came with those attributes? Is that the fruit that's in your life? Is that the fruit that's being produced? Now, whenever I think of judging, in the sense that it said there in our passage this morning to judge, in our passage here, in the main passage, what we looked at this morning, there where it says in Romans chapter 2, um, Therefore thou art inexcusable, O man, whosoever thou art the judgest. For when thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself. If thou judge, and look how many times judge shows up in there. Every time that word is used, it's that crino, that's under condemnation. Whenever I think of judging to condemnation, there is one story from the Bible that always jumps into my mind from the Gospels. Turn with me to John chapter 8. And we're going to pick it up just at verse 3. John chapter 8, verse 3. It says, And the scribes and the Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst... They say unto, her, unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what sayest thou? As they said, tempting him, that they might have, an, have to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote on the ground, as though he had heard them not. So when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and said, He that is without sin amongst you, let him cast a stone at her. And again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. And when they which heard it, being convicted by their own conscience, 
went out by one by one, beginning at the eldest, even unto the least, or last. And Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in the midst. Now, before I get into the last part of this, I want to set this up in your mind a little bit here. A little bit of a picture story, if you would. Here we have a woman who was caught in adultery, the very act, most likely in the bed. One of the things we don't think about when we think about this or when we see the stories portrayed to us, be it on TV or in, in movies, is this woman most likely was drug out naked. Cast in the midst of those who would stone her. Now I know many pastors want to go on the point, where's the man? Yeah, he should have been there too. Most likely she was set up for failure by these Pharisees and Sadducees or the Pharisees and, and scribes. Most likely she was set up for failure. Probably, probably enticed by one of them. And so they, he, they, they drag her forward. And she comes, and there's a crowd gathered around. We know from prior to this, he was already teaching. There was a crowd gathered around. They throw her down in the midst. And I doubt, don't doubt that she was bawling not only for her sin, but for her, her, her shamedness for being naked before this crowd. And upset. And also probably expecting to honestly be put to death. So here she is lying before them. They have now condemned her to death. They have judged her already. But, you know, lest they could trick Jesus, they thought, well, let's just take, him, take her before him. So as she's there on the ground, he says, hey, you that are without sin, let you be the first to cast the stone. And I love, I love that it says that they started to leave from the oldest to the youngest. Now, we know there's a lot of people who want to say, we don't, we don't, we don't know what he wrote on the ground, but there's people who are like, well, I envision him writing sins or names with sin or something like that. It doesn't matter what he was writing. He could have been playing tic-tac-toe. All right? But what does matter is that you notice those who have been the longest around have the greatest account of sin. And those were most likely the loudest proponents of condemning her. Because they were some, some sort of position or authority. And they began to leave from the oldest to the youngest. And then she was left with just Jesus. And in verse 10, When Jesus had lifted himself up and saw none but the woman, he said unto her, Woman, where are those thine accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? Same word, guys. Hath no man condemned thee? And she said, No man, Lord. And Jesus saith unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. What an amazing story of grace. What an amazing illustration of the love of Christ. That he who had the right to stone her according to the law, he had no sin, condemned her not. But because he loved her, was willing to say, go and do it no more. When we go, we should go in the same heart that our Savior goes. A heart of love, hoping to restore someone. Hoping to draw back in a brother or sister in Christ, a lost sheep. We should go in that same heart, in that same vein. We shouldn't go in our own self-arrogance and pride as to like the elders that, that drug her out there and threw her in the midst did. This is why I detest gossip so much. And backbiting. I hate backbiting and gossip because you know what that is? That's you condemning somebody. And you're trying to get other people to condemn them with you. Yeah, you know what? You want to know my shortcomings? If somebody comes to you and starts gossiping about how bad I am, don't bother listening to them anymore. Come and talk to me. I'll tell you. Yeah, I mess up. Yeah, I sin. Yeah, I am not perfect. You don't need to go ask other people about it or listen to them when they're talking to you about me 
or anybody else for that matter. Go to the person. If they're honest, they'll talk to you about it. You know, one of the most loving things that has ever happened to me in my entire walk with my Savior was I was steeped in sin. I'm not going to get into what it was and all that stuff, but I was steeped in a sin as a believer, young believer. And Mike, you guys know Mike, I talk about him a lot. Mike came to me with tears in his eyes because our fellowship was, not, our fellowship was lacking because of my sin. And he came to me with tears in his eyes. And he's like, Brian, I love you. And because I love you, I have to tell you. I have to tell you. And I want you to know, I didn't take this as a light matter. I spent two weeks in prayer over this. Two weeks studying myself and studying the scriptures to make sure that you were, that what I was going to say to you was right. And he came to me and he told me, Brian, repent, you are wrong. You know what my initial response was? Get out of here. I didn't want to hear that. Nobody wants to be told when they're wrong or when they're sinning, do they? None of us like that. And we get that arrogant, self-righteous attitude that, "Ah, I know. You're not telling me something I don't know about myself. No, I'm not. You're right. I'm trying to tell you something that you need to deal with. Because it's going to lead to your destruction. And he did that. And he went away. And he said he went home and bawled for hours because he thought he had lost me. He said, there's no way, even if Brian repents, there's no way we're ever going to be friends again. And when I finally let God speak to me through what he had said, I did repent. And I went over to his house. And I actually repented to him for the way I treated him. I asked for his forgiveness. And told him that there was nothing more loving he could have done to me, for me than to call me on the carpet for my sin. But he did it in the right heart. He did it in a heart that wanted to show me my error. When you judge, if, you, if I can use that word, when you judge, not to condemnation, but out of a heart that loves and wants to restore somebody. And wants to restore somebody. I've had many conversations with people over the years, and it's difficult, guys, when you have to call somebody on the carpet for something they're doing wrong. But if we love them, we would do it. If we love them, we will do it. I mean, isn't that why he taught us in Matthew about church discipline, the discipline in a believer's life? Isn't that why he taught us that? It says in there that we might win a brother, that we might restore somebody. If your goal is to destroy somebody and not restore somebody, your heart is wrong. You need to deal with yourself. You need to deal with yourself. So they bring this woman there, and he says, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. But jump down to verse 15 of that same passage. The problem is that when we judge, oftentimes we, are not, we don't understand. We're not to judge to condemnation. We're to judge according to understanding, our understanding. But the problem is that sometimes we don't judge according to God's understanding. We judge according to our understanding. Let me rephrase that. And look what he says in verse 15. Ye judge after the flesh. In other words, you judge according to what you feel and what you think. I judge no man. You condemn based off of what you think and feel. So, which is exactly what our text is talking about this morning. Turn back with me to our main text now. He says this, Therefore thou art inexcusable, O man, whosoever thou art that judgest. For when thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself. For thou that judgest, doest the same thing. I want you to pay attention to the word doest there. We're going to come back to that in a second. But we are sure... But we are sure that the judgment of God is according to the truth against them which commit such things. 
And thinkest thou this, O man, that judgest them which do such things, and doest the same, that thou shalt escape the judgment of God? That word doest and do the same and to do over and over, you see that in there as well with the judgment? That idea is to practice. So let me say it this way to you if I can. Can we judge? Not if we're practicing the same. Not if we're practicing the same. If you're a gossip and a backbiter, don't go tell somebody they're a gossip and a backbiter. You don't get to do that. But if you've corrected yourself, your walk with Christ, and you've examined yourself, and you're seeing clearly now, you've humbled yourself, you've submitted to him, you've repented for the beam that was in your eye, then you can certainly go to somebody and try to help remove the, the speck in theirs. You certainly can. But the question still remains this morning, what can we really judge? We see we can't judge the condemnation. We don't get to send anybody to hell. Or for that matter, to heaven. So what do we get to judge? The problem is that we, that we face when it comes to the word judge is this. We most likely think of one thing when our words say another. The word judge in the way we think that we are judging only appears, at least I hope in the way you think you're judging, only is used three times in the New Testament. Three times in the New Testament, this word judge is used, which would mean or describe anything but condemnation. Here's the two times that it's used. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Two of the times. It's used three times. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Read verses 14 through 16 with me if you would. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. But he that is spiritual judges all things, yet himself is judged of no man. For he who hath, know, hath known the mind of the Lord, that he, for he hath known the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him. But we have the mind of Christ." This word judge that is used here is the judge I think we think of. It means to examine. When he says there, but the spiritual examines all things, yet the, him, he himself is examined of no man. This is the idea. Isn't that what we think of when we think of judging? To examine somebody, to look at the situation, and to, to make a rendered judgment based off the examination? This is the idea that he's talking about here. And this is the way we think of judgment, but that's not what the world sees. They see us going, you're going to hell. And you know what? Yeah. That's a true statement. But do you go there with the heart that says, hey, except for the grace of God and, his, and the Lord Jesus Christ in my life, I was going to hell too. Or do you go there with, well, look at how good I am now. <sighs> you sinner, you. What heart do you go to him with? Let's look at another time this is used. I like this one a little bit more because Paul uses it in this, in this regard of being judged, and I love this. Paul, turn, you're, you're already right there. We're just going to be in 1 Corinthians chapter 4. Read verses 1 through 4 with me. He says, Let no man so account of us as of ministers of Christ. No, excuse me. Let a man so account of us as of ministers of Christ and steward to the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required in the stewards that a man be found faithful. But with me, it is a very small thing that I should be judged of you or of man's judgment. Yea, I judge my, my, not my own self, for I know nothing by myself, yet am not hereby justified. Yet I am not thereby, hereby justified, but he that judgeth me is the Lord. This is what he's saying. It's not a, it doesn't bother me if you want to examine me. It doesn't bother me if you want to judge me. Because you're not the judge I'm going to answer to. You're not the examiner I'm worried about. It's God that I worry about when he examines me. And then he changes it to the condemnation. Because when God judges me, he's going to judge me to condemnation. I don't want to be judged that way. I don't want to be condemned. 
So I'm going to worry about God's judgment. But you can examine me all day long. You can look at me all day long and say, what's so wrong with me? I'm okay with that. This is his point. The only other time that this, this word judge is used in this, in this idea of examining is actually um, another time when it's speaking with those who would come into the church to prophesy that we're to judge what they say and examine what they say. It's no different than what the Old Testament says, right? Let a prophet be proven by his words. In other words, somebody comes in here and says, I got a prophecy for this church, right? And they give us their word and it doesn't come to pass. They're a false prophet, all right? That's the idea. That, that we should examine that. And look at those things. The idea of this one is the anacrino. Anna. Right? Anacrino. To scrutinize, to examine, to question, and to discern. That's the judgment we have capability of doing. So maybe the question we really need to ask ourselves is not should we judge, but should we scrutinize or examine people? And I'm not even going to sit here and just give you the answer. I'm sure you're already thinking of it. But I want to let this one come directly from the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Turn it back with me to Matthew chapter 7 when we started at this morning. Are we to examine and scrutinize people? Let's see what the Lord has to say about this. Matthew chapter 7, pick it up with the verse 15 with me. He says, Beware of the false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly there are raving wolves. Ye shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes, or thorns or, uh, uh, grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. Every good, tree cannot bring forth evil, every, every good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Wherefore, by, ye are, by their fruits you shall know them. Yeah, we get to examine. We get to scrutinize their fruits. Their fruits. We don't get to examine and scrutinize and send them to hell. Do we get to judge? Yes but only in the sense that we examine or scrutinize. And by the way, the word examined is used countless numbers of times, speaking of this throughout the, throughout the Bible. We get to examine them that way. Yes, we're examining the fruits of someone's life and help to correct the bad fruit. It's to be hewn down and cast into the fire. If there's something that is negative or bad in somebody's life, we're supposed to help them remove it. If somebody's struggling with pornography, let's help them get rid of their computer. If they need to look something up on the internet, let's be their accountability partner. partner. Come to my house, I'll help you look. Or let's meet somewhere and go through it. If somebody's struggling with finances and managing their money and you actually manage your money well, help them. Don't go to them and condemn them and say, oh, shame on you for making such bad choices. No, step in and say, let's start correcting those and making better choices. If somebody's having troubles with anything, guys, from the greatest of what we perceive to be sins to the least of them, those of us who are spiritual and know how to handle these things should be willing to step in and help them. Yeah, judging them but not under condemnation, but to help, to love, to bring forth the fruit in their life that we really want to see. Can you be better? Yes. Can you do better? Of course. Can I help you? I hope so. But here's the scary part. If we go in there with a heart, back to our text again, guys. If we go in there with a the heart of condemnation, here's the scary part for us. I'm going to close with this. Look what it says in verse 5. That if we go in there with a the heart 
not of love, look what it's going to do to us. But after the hardness of thine own impenitent heart, treasurest up thy, unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath and the revelation of the righteousness of God. We will one day stand before Christ. And we will one day have to let him examine our fruits. Even as believers, we will stand before him. And he will examine our fruits. What fruit was produced in your life? Was it bitterness? Anger? Fornication? Adultery? Covetousness? Or was it the fruits of the Spirit? Love? Joy? Peace? Long-suffering? Gentleness? Meekness? Temperance? Against such there is no law. We don't want to lay our treasures, as it says here, up in heaven from the hardness of our own impenitent and unrepentant hearts. I don't want that treasure. I want the treasure that the Lord speaks about in Matthew 6 when he talks about store up for yourself treasures in heaven where moth and, crust, moth and rust do not destroy. Thieves can't break in and still. I'm kind of misquoting that a little bit, I know. So, if someone is serving someone else or they're doing something sinful, we are to restore them. We are to restore them. That is our goal, not to condemn them. So when somebody says, don't judge me, our response should be, I am not condemning you. I'm examining you to help you. I love you and I want to restore you. 